Hi, this is Michael Buffer, and welcome to the Box Hard Podcast. Hello, everyone. This is Mikey Garcia. It's the monster from the swamp, Regis Ruru Program. Hey, what's up? This is King Carlos Molina, former IBF world champ. This is Michael, the bounty hunter, 2012 Olympian, and your people's champ. This is Charlie Edwards, flyweight champion of the world. This is Fast Eddie Chambers, and you're listening to the Box Hard Podcast with my main man, Joey Kosmo. Hello, everybody, and welcome to episode 308 of the Box Heart Podcast. I'm your host, Joey Coastman. I'm joined, as ever, by, you know who it is, it's the former heavyweight world title challenger, the greatest US heavyweight at the time, Mr. Fast Eddie Chambers. Eddie, how's it going, man? I'm good, my man. I like that intro. <laughs> you, How deserve, about you? you deserve a good intro i am very good when speaking with you eddie we're going to dive straight into the review part of the show we're going to start here at the kilimanjaro hall in tanzania hassan Mwakinyo, now 20 and 2 a bit of a cult hero after coming over to the uk and knocking out sam eggington in a round or two or three can't remember now it was early that's what i do know he was able to knock out in round four julius indongo the former unified world champion um indongo has regressed horrifically I don't know why the fight was up at 154. Indongo really is a 140 pounder. He's now 23 and 4. It was for the African Boxing Union Super Welterweight title. Indongo dropped in the fourth round. Uh, I think maybe given a count, I'm not sure. And the stoppage was a little bit premature, I think. I've seen a clip of the stoppage. Indongo wasn't happy, but I'm really pleased for Mwakinyo. What a scalp for his resume. Moving out now to the Headingley Rugby League Stadium in Leeds, Yorkshire, United Kingdom. Over here, let's start with the prospect on the undercard, or one of them, Jack Bateson. Um... I think he's from Leeds. He's now 14-0. and 0, A points win over six. However, he was down in the second round. And a lot of people were saying he didn't deserve that victory. He got in with Felix Garcia, who's now 7-3 and three with a draw. Mark Lyson, the referee and the sole judge of the contest, 58-56 to Bateson, despite losing a 10-8 round in the second round there over six rounds. Elsewhere on the card, Ebony Bridges now 7-1. and one. A points win after eight two-minute rounds against Maley. Gangloff again a really close fight a lot of people feeling like Ebony Bridges was gifted a decision 77 76 from the referee and judge Steve Gray uh, Maylis Gangloff hadn't been stopped in her two losses obviously had a record of five and two I don't think she'd beaten anyone with a winning record Ebony Bridges clearly hurt her right hand in the contest and um, she kept shaking it and stuff like that she since had an x-ray and there's no break or anything like that uh, but yeah, very much got away with it, I think, there, Ebony Bridges. Elsewhere on the card, Hopi Price with an impressive knockout in round two against Zahid Hussein, who's now 16-2. and two. Hopi Price is now 6-0. and oh. uh, Hussein was down in the first round and in the second round. Both boxers were cut, though. That one was for the vacant IBO International <laughs> Super Bantamweight title. Um... Elsewhere on the card, Katie Taylor, now 19-0. and 0. She was able to beat over 10 two-minute rounds. Jennifer Han, um, Jennifer Han now 18-4 and 4 with a draw. It was for the WBC, WBA, IBF, and WBO female lightweight world titles. Han was down in the eighth round. Um, expected, to be honest. Katie Taylor points win. That's what I'm starting to predict for almost all of her recent fights. Um, so, yeah, I thought she might stop Natasha Jonas, I think I said, but she obviously didn't, and, uh, you know, she beat Jennifer Han there. I will be asking about um, what Chantel Cameron thinks about that fight when we speak to her later on in the show. Um, elsewhere on the card, Connor Ben, now 19-0, and 0, a unanimous decision against Adrian Granados, who's now... Um, 21 and 9 with three draws. Much better fighter than his record suggests. It was for the WBA Continental Welterweight title. Um, really exciting start to the fight. I felt that Ben was putting the pressure on. He was very aggressive. Uh, I was quite surprised how aggressive he was because, you know, Granados is a pretty hard puncher himself, to be honest. Uh, the chin of Granados was granite. Ben was landing right hands and left hooks. Big looking ones. Um, a hell of a lot during the fight. And I was a little bit worried what Ben was going to look like in terms of his gas tank late on. But for me, he passed that test as well. Um, yeah, impressive performance from Connor Ben, who I think is still, you know, improving all the time. And yeah, there's there's so many great fights for him. I'd love to see him fight someone like a Danny Garcia. 
Um, let's move on to elsewhere on the card. Giovanni Straffon, the Mexican, 24-4 and four now with a draw. Coming off, of course, that knockout demolition against James Tennyson. He stepped in with Maxi Hughes, the man having an Indian summer. Oh, boy, oh, boy. It's been about 18 months he's been on top of his game. Now 24-5 and five with two draws. It was for the IBO World Lightweight title. Maxi Hughes was unbelievable. He hurt Straffon badly during a couple of the rounds. He's not known as a puncher himself. Um, definitely the, the most improved fighter in Britain in the last 18 months. Not known as a puncher, like I say, but he looked really good. Um, you know, his punches were hurtful, and Straffon's power didn't come into it. I'm almost wondering if Tennyson's uh, loss to him made him look a little bit better than he actually is, because he was running out of ideas as soon as the first or second round Straffon, but Maxi Hughes boxed out of his skin, and it was just a pleasure to watch, because he's a guy that has had it so, so, so tough, never had anything gifted to him. I mean, like we say, he's got five losses, and it seems like he's in the peak of his career. It's, it's quite unbelievable. All the best to him. He's almost got like a kind of Tevin Farmer-ish record, you know, so let's see what, what he can do. He certainly does Deserves a big fight. Um, talking of big fights, we saw the rematch on the on the on the main event. Maurizio Lara, twenty three and two with a draw. Now uh, Josh Warrington, thirty and one with a draw. Um, it was it was a really good first two rounds. I think um, Josh Warrington won the first round. I think the second round Josh was doing pretty good in. However, what I didn't like about Josh was that at times he was happy to throw with Maurizio Lara. That was what was the undoing in the first fight. It didn't happen in these two rounds that we saw. Doesn't mean he was going to go on to dominate the fight. We cannot tell anything from those two rounds there. It reminds me a lot of, like, um, Andrew Maloney and Joshua Franco, too. Yeah, Maloney had a great first round and a great second round or whatever. It doesn't mean anything. He had a great first round and second round in the first fight, and so did Warrington in the first fight. Uh, you know, against against Maurizio Lara, it doesn't mean a thing. So we have no idea what would have happened. But Lara was cut over his left eye. Um, it was a ha head clash. It, there'd been many head clashes as well in that in that two rounds, and the contest was stopped on the advice of the ringside doctor, which I felt it would be a no contest, but it ended up being a technical draw after uh, two rounds. So yeah, that one is that one. Very much um, a shame to end the night like that. Um, we need the third fight. We really need the third fight. It's as simple as that. Moving out now to the... Um, no, actually, I've flown for everything there. I really have. That is the end of the review part of the show. It's now time, just before we wrap this up, to welcome our sole guest on this week's podcast. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome the undefeated and reigning WBC female super lightweight world champion. It is, of course, Miss Chantel Cameron. Chantel, welcome back on the show. Oh, it's good to be back. Hey, it's good to have you back, and I really mean that. So, Chantel, we last spoke back in February, uh, just before the yeah. fight with Melissa Hernandez. It was set to take place in March. Obviously, it got pushed back to May. Um, let's start with that. Have you ever had a girl poking her tongue out at you in the face off before? Was that a bit <laughs> awkward? <laughs> you know what? I was literally just let it go above my head, just thinking it was a bit of a front. I think it was a bit of shy. And a bit of insecurity as well, knowing that she wasn't that confident going into the fight. So I let it go above me because I was there for business and I knew that I was going to do a number on her. So I just literally, it, just, it made me laugh, to be honest, thinking, I'm just going to punch your head in. And that was it. Yeah. I, I gotta say, I remember when when she did it. Like the look on your face was so serious as well. I was thinking, wow. Like, are you not gonna smile? <laughs> Literally, I I was in pure poker face. I was just like, wait until we get in this ring. And I think that was my mindset. She done it, and I was just, literally, I was like, are you gonna react to this or I'm gonna save it until we get to the ring? And that's what I did. Yeah, you said I'm not. Did. I'm not really, I save it, I save it all, I let, I process it all, save it all, and then I unleash it when the bell goes. Absolutely, and the fight itself, I mean, you absolutely destroyed Melissa Hernandez, who was a good f fighter in her own right, stopped her in round five. Uh, she'd only been stopped once before, it was 14 years prior. A lot of the American yeah. female fighters on Twitter five minutes before the fight started were very vocal, I guess, and as soon as the first 30 yeah. seconds of the fight were over, they must have all logged out. Uh, tell me about <laughs> <laughs> tell me about the fight and uh, your sensational American debut, Chantel. <laughs> Oh, that made me laugh, got logged out. <laughs> but um, 
yeah, it was a great experience. The whole fight week, it was good for my team, but we all had such a good time. And that was down to matching for making it so accommodating. It was, it was unreal. It was a really good week. But the fight itself, I was a bit disappointed with the stoppage. I think it took away the actual performance for me. And the stoppage was coming anyway. Like, if you heard my corner, it was telling me to be patient and wait for it. So that's what I was doing, was waiting for it. And obviously, I let my shots go. But the, the stoppage was premature, and it was a bit annoying, really. I, I know for a fact, if it, went around, if it went on a couple more rounds, I would have had a clean stoppage. It was coming. So that was a little bit frustrating, but I've got to move on from it now. Yeah, it was a weird stoppage because I think the stoppage could have been done by the referee perhaps a round or two earlier. It was a weird moment to actually yeah, I jump think in, he yeah. must have panicked. I think he must have panicked. I think she was taking a shot. She weren't really following much back. And I think he just panicked, but it was the wrong time. But again, she like she wasn't the stoppage was coming. I think anyone could see that the stoppage was there. It was literally just it was a time and it was waiting to happen but um, she weren't really like she weren't a threat she, she didn't think she landed on me so but it was just annoying because it could have been a much better stoppage yeah, and it was, um, you know, it was a brilliant end to the fight. Like I say, the, the performance was great, you know, from the tongue poke into her ring walk. Her ring walk was unbelievable. Yeah. Um, but yeah, brilliant stuff. Um, I'm very happy for you because I've always been, obviously, a big fan of yours. It's no secret. You're my favorite female fighter. Lately, I've been doing my bit for women's boxing, getting more and more women on the show. One of the women that yeah. came on the show was Mary McGee. Now, at the time... Okay. Mary had a fight lined up against Victoria Bustos, so when I asked Mary at the end if there's anyone on her radar, perhaps in the future, I was shocked when she called out your name, because no one else has really called you out, and there's a reason behind that, obviously. Um, next thing you know, you know, she suffers a leg injury, her fight with Bustos is off, then it's announced you'll be fighting McGee. Um, tell me, just briefly, Chantel, what you think of her as a fighter. Obviously, she's had a lot of ups and downs, and she seems to now be on the top of her game despite her age. Firstly, is she your second favourite female fighter? Who, her? Yeah, is she your second? Um, do you know what? I'm, I, I, I think... I think Clarissa Shields is up there because, uh, you know, we okay, sung yeah, together. Yeah. I don't know if you've seen that. We sung together. So she's yeah, got a... yeah, I've seen There that. we go. <laughs> just checking in, just making sure she weren't your second favourite now. But, um, <laughs> yeah, I think she's a good fight and I'm glad she shouted me out. So I feel like I've been avoided for a long time. Obviously, with the WBC belt, I was hoping I'd get more opportunities and kind of dangle it in front of people's faces to get in the fight. But I think Mary knows that I think she, she, I think she knows that I'm a good opponent. I'm a threat, and she wants a good fight as well. She's like me. I think my division is we all want to fight each other because we all want them fights, a good fight. But I just think as an all rounder, I'm a better fighter than Mary. I think she brings a bit of power into the ring. I don't think stylistically she's great, and I think she's a great boxer. Um, I think she's like quite novice. Her style is quite novice. The way she throws her shots. What I've watched of her, that's what it seems. I just think I'm gonna be faster, fitter, stronger, and just I think I can I can box how I want to box. Yeah, I, I think it's gonna be a great fight. Um, and yeah, by the way, because you asked me about my, you know that now you know me and Clarissa sung. Me and you haven't yet sung, so it might have to happen <laughs> now. It might have to happen, Chantel, for next time. Just warning you, <laughs> if you want to okay, stay I'll on that, prepared. if you want to stay in that number one spot. <laughs> Okay, um, 100%. I'll be prepared. Or maybe we'll wrap. <laughs> Don't want to be following footsteps. <laughs> maybe Anytime. we'll make a wrap. <laughs> Anytime. Um, for those that don't know, this fight is part of a four female mini tournament. Um, you against McGee, yeah. Callie Reese against Jessica Kamara. Uh, the two winners will then fight each other, in which uh, will kind of be for the, yeah, it will be for the undisputed status, all the belts yeah. at 140. How did this come around, Chantel? This is obviously a great, great thing for women's boxing. Um, I think it come around because, obviously, I personally, for me, I've been saying about I want to be undisputed in a division. And I think all of I think it's down to us girls as well. That we all said that we'd fight each other. So it's made it easier for the promoters. And obviously for women's boxing it's great because it's a tournament, it's never been done before. 
and I think, I think it was I think this will be the first time it's been a women's tournament, so it's going to be history making as well. And I think it just it, like I said, I think it just come across a lot easier because all of us want it. We all want to be in this tournament, so it's just made it things a lot easier. But it's been in the works for a few months now. Yeah. And nothing has yet been said about venues. I didn't know anything about a date up until you posted about half an hour ago or whatever on social media about yes. a date. Um, can so you shed... my date... Yeah, sorry. Yeah, my date is October the 30th at the O2 on the Dillian White undercard. There we go. There we go. Okay, so it's a brilliant stage. Um, yeah, because I was wondering if it was going to wind up in the UK or the US again. Good to hear it's going to be at the O2. Um, I'm guessing yeah. you're really happy about this situation because I'm going to guess again here, you probably haven't had many times in your career, if any, where you've basically had two fights lined up in a row of real substance. Never. I've never had it where I've, n- I've known where I'm going. And also, it's the first time I've boxed an, uh, an actual world champion. So... Yeah. I'm so excited for it because I've boxed former world champions, but since I've been professional, I've been screaming to box an actual champion. And unfortunately, like when I have boxed for world titles, it's always been vacant. So the IBO was vacant, the WBC was vacant. So this is my time now to actually face a champion. And it's like when people say that like, oh, I'm motivated, it's been um, like a kick up the ass, blah blah. Like when I say, it, I mean, it's generally been the biggest motivation. Like my whole mindset changed. I've never ever been so motivated, and it's just it's been a massive turnaround for me, and I just can't wait. And you know, like always, it wouldn't be right if I didn't ask you for your reaction to Katie Taylor's performance on the weekend, a win over Jennifer Han. Uh, what did you make of yeah. that? I'm still one of the people that would love to see that fight down the line for you. Um, yeah, I think Kate was going to win comfortably on point. But I think uh, she made it a bit harder than she needed to. I was a bit shocked. I think um, I think she slowed down a bit. Hmm. Yeah, I think a lot of people are saying that, to be honest with you. Um... Yeah, I think, I think she has slowed down a bit. Like, I, I don't think I'm ever going to get that fight, but I just think maybe she is coming to the end end of the line now where she should retire undefeat, undefeated. Hmm. That's an interesting uh, viewpoint, especially as someone who obviously has been linked with her for for such a long time. I'm sure you'd love the fight. Um, My next question was kind of going to involve that possible fight. I'll I'll jump into it here. I don't want to look too far in the future, but obviously... If you were to beat McGee, if you were to to, to, yeah. to to win the fight against the winner of Reese and Kamara, you'd be undisputed. I believe you will do that. But what would be next for you ideally after that? Have you fought that far? Would you like to defend all the belts or would you like to move up or down in weight? Would a Katie Taylor fight for all your belts at 140 be the, the best thing? Have you fought that far? Do you know what? No. So I take each fight step by step. So even now, like yeah. I'm in this tournament, I'm still just, it's me versus Mary. I'm not thinking about the tournament. I've had this discussion with my coach, Jamie. Is I know that I'm in a tournament, but I'm not going to look into that. Like, it's another fight. I have to win. And I win, I'll go into the next stage. And for me, it's just get the belts, get the, defend my WBC, grab hold of the IBF, grab hold of the Ring Magazine, and then go get the best of the belt. So for me, it's like my mindset is, Focus on what's in front of me. Don't focus beyond that. But even though it's a tournament, I'm not focusing on Kelly V or Jessica. So whoever the best woman wins in that fight, that's who I'll box because I believe I'm going to beat Mary. Yeah, but until then, I'm just going to focus on October 30th. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think no, you've got so you should. And I yeah. think if I keep, if I, if I focus on, uh, if I win this tournament, maybe I'll fight Katie. Like I've chased Katie for years now. And it's never even been a conversation. So I'm not even going to waste my energy on thinking if I win this tournament, I'll face Katie because the likelihood of it is I probably won't. Mm. So for me, it's just grab these belts, but just for me, just to say I've achieved my dream. Yeah, no, absolutely. And whatever absolutely. comes after that is a bigger bonus. 
yeah, for sure. No, that's that's the right answer. That's the smart answer. Um, my, my final question for you, Chantel, if you've got any closing words for the listeners just before we wrap it up. Obviously, it's, the, it's only the second time you've been on. It was a great conversation we had the first time. It's been a great one here. What's your what's your closing message? To the, ugh, closing message to the listeners. <laughs> Next time I'm on air, then we're gonna wrap. There we go. There we go. Listen, I hope you're. I'm going to hold you to that. I'm going to hold you to that. Which rap are we going to do? Have we got any idea? No, just write some cut. Okay, that is it. Well, I'm not a rapper. There you um, go. No, just hope everyone can tune in October the 30th. He's going to make a great fight. Mary's a good, strong champion, and I think facing someone like Mary is definitely going to bring out the best version of me because I'm not showing yet. I think. A competitive fight is well, really going to show people what I can do, and I've not had that opportunity yet, so I'm excited for it because I think a good, strong champion who's going to whack me back and put put a bit of pressure on me is when people are going to really see what I can do. And it's a fight I absolutely cannot wait for. It's going to be a great fight. Obviously, Chantel, such a tremendous fighter. Mary as well got a great, great story. Seems to be on top of her game at the minute. But listen, Chantel, it's more than a pleasure speaking with you. Thank you for your time. I will certainly be tuning in on October 30th. And I'm looking forward to speaking with you again. And we will do a wrap. You've said it to the listeners. It's happening. (laughs) I'm going to practice. Okay, take care. Speak soon, <laughs> Chantel. God bless. Uh, see ya. Thank you. Bye. Okay, now it's time for part two on this week's show. This part, of course, the news part of the show. Uh, two pieces of news to mention at the moment. We've got the fact that the... Uh, you know, the women's undisputed 140 pound crown is up for grabs in this four way showdown. As we just spoke to her there, uh, Chantel Cameron takes on. Um, Mary McGee, that one to take place on the Dillian White undercard October 30th in London and then the fight between Callie Reese and um, Jessica Kamara, that one to take place I believe in the States at some point, I don't think there's been a date announced for that, but all of those fights are going to be on the zone. Um, in other news Maxi Hughes following his fantastic win there against um, against Giovanni Straffon, he has been signed by Matram on some kind of promotional agreement. Not quite sure on the length of the agreement, but really pleased for Maxi Hughes, who, like I say, has, has had it very, very tough, and, you know, he's on such a roll at the moment. Um, okay, that's it for the news. If anything else develops from now to the end of the show, I will speak about it on the outro. Jumping on now to the preview part of the show. We're going to start here tomorrow night at the Wurvesee Stadium in Klagenfurt, Austria. Over here on the zone, we've got... Philip Hergovic, 12-0, in a fight here against Marco Radonjic, who has a record of 22-0 with 22 KOs. Uh, you look down that record and there's no one uh, you know, that stands out at all, but he has knocked out all these guys. Um, you know, I'm just looking at it now. He's knocked out one guy three times, four times, uh, I should say, a guy called Harris Radmilovic. He's knocked him out in the second round. He's knocked him out in the second round again. He's knocked him out in the third round, and he's knocked him out in the third round. So that's interesting. He's boxed a couple of debutants, and in recent times, he's been boxing guys with records of 1-22, and 22, um, and he rematched him as well, knocked him out in two rounds, then he knocked him out in one round. So this is the definition of an absolute padded record. Um, it really is. I mean, gosh. But anyway, this is a fighter here um, from Montenegro based in Germany. Um, 31 years of age, Marco Radonjic. Anyways, that's it for Austria. Moving out now to the Roland Garros in, in, in Paris, France. Over here we have Igor McCorkin, 24-2, and two, former opponent of, of um, Sergei Kovalev. I remember him boxing him. We were supposed to get Igor McCorkin against um, Callum Johnson. That fight never ended up happening, but that would have been a good one. Um, he's 24-2 and two these days. He steps in against Mateo Baudelik, who has a record of 20-1. and One, one loss by KO. Um, yeah, the French fighter there. Um, Will that be interesting? I'm not sure, to be honest. I hadn't heard of Baudelik uh, before. Um, on the undercard, it's a bit of a kind of show card for these French fighters coming through. We've got Solomon Sissoko, 13-0 and 0 in a 10-rounder against Ismail Aliyev. Um, Ismail Aliyev, 
13 and 2 with a draw, one loss to Patrick Day, one loss to Magomed Kurbanov, um, but a win last time out against Asinia Byfield. So that could be quite cool there. Um, we have Tony Yoka, 10 and 0, the Olympic gold medalist in a 10 rounder against the also undefeated Peter Mylas, who's 15 and 0 with 11 KOs, the Croatian heavyweight. Not a bad fighter, actually. I've heard good things about um, Peter Mylas. Um, he was able to knock out Kevin Johnson, actually, back in 2018. That was quite cool, because around about that time, Daniel Dubois couldn't knock him out. Um, since then, he's he's been in there with Francesco Pianetta, Dennis Baktov. He's got all of those guys, uh, you know, beaten as well. So, yeah, 15 and oh, Could be interesting, that one there. Uh, anyway, that's it for France. Moving out now to the Sky Dome in Coventry, West Midlands, United Kingdom. This one is going to be on Channel 5, so set this one up to tape if you're not watching it live you've got um prospect tommy welch the son of scott welch 4-0 no opponent just yet the son of mick hennessy michael hennessy jr 6-1 and one with a draw no opponent just yet for him you've got idris virgo 10-0 and 0 with a draw no opponent yet for him isaac chamberlain 12-1 and 1, no opponent yet for him um, River Wilson Bent 9 and 0 takes on Sladan Janjanin who is 29 and 8. You've got Casey Benjamin getting in with Jarko Putkonen. You've got Shakam Pitters 15 and 1 uh, taking on Farouk Daku who's 21 and 18 with a draw. You've got Stephen McKenna one half of the McKenna brothers the Irish prospects 8 and 0 his record. He takes on Musa Gary who's 11 and 3 with two draws in the main event. Um, Sam Eggington, 30 and 7, coming off that win against Carlos Molina back in May. He takes on Bilal Jiktu, who has a record of 15 and 0. It's for the WBC Silver Middleweight title. Um, so yeah, definitely Sam Eggington, always a, a good fighter to watch. Elsewhere, moving out now to the Casino del Sol in Tucson, Arizona, USA. On this card, we have uh, not too much really on the undercard of note. The main event. Uh, let's talk about the chief support, actually. Junto Nakatani, 21-0. I'm not sure if he's related to um, the Nakatani that boxed Lomachenko and uh, Tiafimo Lopez. But anyways, he's 21-0, defending his WBO World Flyweight title against Angel Acosta, who's 22-2. And, and the main event, Oscar Valdez, 29-0 in search of win number 30 against Robson Cancisau, who's 16-0. Somebody's own must go. It's for Valdez's WBC World Super featherweight title. Valdez coming off one of the most, you know, tremendous fights and results or whatever you want to say in, in recent times. That win against Miguel Bushell was out of this world. Um, that knockout was, was devastating and it left me really wanting to see him again. I mean, it's probably one of the most brutal ones of this year. It's um, It's been seven months though since that since that fight. Here he steps in against this guy here, a uh, Brazilian fighter. Um, you know what? You know, there's there's been a lot kind of focused on the, the mist or the foul drugs tests from Oscar Valdez. I'm not sure the ins and outs. I don't really like to get into that side of the sport too much. But to think that he's fouled a drug test but he's still being cleared to fight just does not make any sense to me. Um, you know, it doesn't really matter what you foul for. I've heard this, I've heard that, I've heard masking agents, I've heard he's he's took something to cover up other things, I don't know. Oscar Valdez is a friend of the show, he's issued a statement, um, both in, in English and Spanish, for everyone to understand, and I don't want to say he's a dirty fighter, I, I wouldn't want to say that, I don't know the ins and outs, but it just doesn't sit right with me that he has fouled a test, that is a fact. And he's protesting his innocence, you know, he feels that he didn't cheat or anything, he wouldn't take peds, he said, and, uh, you know, whatever, they were in his system, and, or there was something in his system, and how he's been cleared to fight, I, I just do not understand, it's, it's bad on, on Canelo's camp as well, it's another failed drugs test, um, do you want to weigh in on this, Eddie? It's a bit sensitive. I know we got to watch what we say because we don't know the facts, but it, it just, you know, the fact is he did fail a test. He had something in his system he shouldn't have, and he's still been cleared to fight about two weeks after the finding. It seems crazy. It does. It does. Honestly, you know, if it's a banned substance and it looks as if it's not, you know, in the best interest of the sport, got to do what the right thing is. But, I mean, you know, like we don't know the particulars and 
there's got to be some reason that they're allowing the fight to go on. You understand what I'm saying? Like, you got to think that if it was any danger to the other fighter by fighting a guy that's up, you know, hopped up on on on, on uh, the uh, the peds, then you know I would think that they would, you know, disagree with allowing this to go on. But you know, and then obviously you know you got the proud fighters too. Oh, I'll fight him. I don't care. You know what I mean? That's not gonna help him anyway. That kind of thing. And sometimes in that case, you got to save guys for themselves. You know what I mean? But um, as it stands, man, just this whole PED thing, it makes it really, really difficult for all us clean fighters. Seriously, like I haven't went, haven't taken anything in my entire career. You know what I mean? And I was fighting against some of the biggest monsters there were, and um, just had to fight them clean. So if I got to do it, everybody got to do it. You know what I mean? There should be no one person above the rest. You know, what's fair is fair. We got to make sure that everybody has a fair shot, a fair shake to win. You know what I mean? And, and you know, if if that's the case and, and, and people, everyone can, um, it, you can take them, then everybody should be able to take them. You know what I mean? It should be up to, it should be to your discretion. But it's just, I think it's just a little ridiculous. I think um, the fact that this is out here and, and a lot of times they're still allowing fighters to go on with it. Like I said, we don't know the particulars. But it's just, I feel like it's dangerous and it's just unfair. You know what I mean? So let's uh, let's just try to do the best that we can to clean up the sport. That's, that's what I say. Yeah, no one can disagree. But all the best to Oscar Vardes, friend of the show. I hope that, um, you know, he's clean. Moving out now to the RCC Boxing Academy in Russia. Over here, we've got topping the bill, Zul Abdalaev, who's got a record of 13-1. and one. I remember him beating Hank Lundy, but then losing his O to Devin Haney. He gets in with former world champion Dejan Zlatichinin, who, if you remember, box Mikey Garcia back in... January of 2017, he got knocked out brutally against Garcia for the WBC lightweight world title. Since then, he hasn't really done much at all. He stayed at lightweight. He come back with a knockout win later that year. Then he got knocked out in two by uh, by Roberto Ramirez. Since then, he come back, scored a unanimous decision win against Vikshan Mirzabikov, who I don't really know too too much, but here he goes against Zur Abdaliev. It's a really really good fight actually. That that could be that could be a good one there. And we've got on the undercard um, at cruiserweight, we've got Evgeny Tishenko, who's eight and one. He's coming off his sole loss of his career to Tabiso Machunu back in March of this year, uh, when Machunu was able to cause an upset against Tishenko, who of course is a heavyweight. Olympic gold medalist from 2016. Uh, Tishenko steps in against the Russian hammer, Dmitry Kudryashov, 24-4. and four, Only two fights in the 28 he's been involved in have gone the distance. He either gets knocked out or will knock you out. He's a devastating puncher. Should be a great fight there. But having said that, the fact that Tishenko... Um, you know, he's got so much amateur experience. I'd, I'd expect him to be able to pick his way to a to a victory there. Um, and he can punch as well, so he could get a stoppage. We shall see. Always a good fight when Kudryashov's involved. Um, elsewhere on the undercard, just one fighter I want to bring the listeners' attention to. Mohamed Kuju. That's one That's one. Uh, one name there. Mohamed Kuju. That's the first name. 17-0. His surname is Yakubov. Um he, he's fighting in a 10-rounder against Christian Palmer, who's 31-10 and 10 with two draws for the WBC International Super Featherweight title. But Mohamed Kaju Yakubov is, I believe, the number one in the WBO Super Featherweight ranking. So he's actually in line to take on the winner of Jamel Herrin and... Um, and and Shakur Stevenson, and he's 26 years of age, a five foot five southpaw, managed by Igis Klimas, who takes care of um, Lomachenko and Usyk. So he could be one to watch out for in the future. Uh, moving out now to Spain, this one's going to be on the zone. We've got at the Pebayon de la Bal de Hebron in Barcelona, Catalonia, Spain. Over here. Uh, Kiko Martinez, former world champion, 41-10 and 10, with two draws in an eight-rounder against J. Ro Duran, who's 14-9. and nine. Um, We've got Mary Romero, 6-2, and two, fighting for the EBU European female super bantamweight title against our very own Amy Timlin, who's 4-0 and 0 with a draw over 10 two-minute rounds. And topping the bill, Kerman Leharaga, 32-2, uh, and two, Coming off that win against Jez Smith, I believe. He's back in a 12-rounder against Dylan Charat, who's 20-0 with a draw. Uh, that one could be interesting there in Spain because he looked 
he, he didn't really look his old self there, Kerman Laharaga, last time out. Uh, something didn't seem right to me, um, you know, in that fight against Jez Smith. He looked a little bit fragile at times, and I, I would have never said that against the version that beat Bradley Skeet, beat Frankie Gavin, but I think he's, I don't know, he hasn't really looked the same since those two fights with David Avanesian. But anyway, that should be quite good there in Spain. Um, moving out to the crazy card that takes place on Fight TV at the Seminole Hard Rock Hotel and Casino in Hollywood, Florida, USA. Over here, um, it was supposed to be the comeback of Oscar De La Hoya. I think, i got to be honest, I've, I'm going to be honest right here. I was kind of looking forward to see what he looked like in the ring. Um, you know, he, he, he never fought since that loss to Manny Pacquiao, but he was... You know, he was a good fighter at that stage. It's not like he went on for years past his prime kind of thing. He was a good fighter at that stage. And he's never, ever got back in since then. Um, he was going to be taking on Vita Belfort, who I don't know much about. I think he was a UFC guy. He had a one boxing fight 15 years ago. Um, he's 1-0 and as a pro with, with one KO in, in the first round. But in steps, Evander Holyfield, a man who we did see past his prime, um, but he still might be good enough to beat Vita Belfort. I'm not sure how much notice he's had. I know he was training for another fight, and that fight fell through. I heard that Evander Holyfield was going to be suing Triller uh, because of some kind of thing they didn't deliver on, and then next thing you know, he's been shoehorned into the main event here. Evander Holyfield, 44-10 and 10 with two draws. We saw the return of Roy Jones Jr. and Mike Tyson, Eddie, in an exhibition. Um... I don't think there was that much excitement around seeing Roy Jones again because we'd seen him for so long past his prime. He'd probably only been retired for two or three years officially uh, when he when he fought Mike Tyson last year. Um, you know, Mike Tyson, though, had been out the ring for a long time. Do you think there is the same level of excitement to see... Holy probably not. I think it's unfair. But should there be the same level of hype to see, uh, to see Holyfield back as well? Well, somewhat. I mean, both. I think all three of them. Now that you mentioned, they fought past their prime uh, in a sense. I mean, you know, Mike Tyson, but Mike, I just think was off for so long. You know what I mean? After I think the loss to um, uh, the big Irishman, I just can't remember. Can't remember. Uh, Kevin McBride, wasn't it? I think. Kevin McBride. There we go. I think, and that was, and you know, and then also the hype behind seeing Mike throw punches, hit the pads. And you know, people just kind of remember show, them. Show from... someone a combination at a bar, I think, yeah, as well. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, so it kind of, you know, like, man, maybe Mike ain't, you know, he's not as gone as everybody thought he would have been. And it turns out that he actually looked pretty good, and you know, considering, you know, being off for so long and being 54, 55 And smoking so much oh. marijuana. Yeah. Yeah, all of that. Yeah. And then, you know, so with Evander, though, I don't know. Evander fought past his prime, but he was even still trying to really compete. Uh, at one point, and it, 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 it was just probably wasn't wasn't good, and I don't think Evander had the same level of fame that Mike had, even though he beat Mike and he was a great fighter in his own right and one of my favorites all time. But I just don't think he had the star power. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. To draw that kind of interest, especially going past, you know, his period, his time. You know, his time was the 90s on the early 2000s. Eight, well, let's say 80s and 90s more so. Um, and, and But Mike, he's just like one of those transcendent names, you know, you're going to remember, like Ali. So it's, um, I, I, of course, there should be the same amount of excitement, in my opinion. I mean, he's, he's an all-time great who actually beat Mike, but he's just not as popular. You understand what I'm saying? And it's just, it, you know, no matter what you say or what you do, that's just, that's just the facts. You know what I mean? So probably not you know what i mean he's probably you know there, there there's not going to be that level of excitement but it's just i want to i kind of i kind of want to see it now thinking about it and like i said i was always a big holyfield fan so i kind of want to see how he looks in, in in i guess in comparison to uh to mike tyson too yeah, he's coming off 10 years out the ring. I think he's kept himself in relatively good shape in that time, Evander Holyfield. I don't think he has been uh, smoking weed and stuff. Um, we'll see, though. We'll see. You know, It's going to be interesting to see him back. You know, But he's taken on this guy who, uh, six foot tall, southpaw, not sure how old he is. Yeah, whatever. 
Um, on the undercard, we're not going to talk about this too much, but Anderson Silva, last time out, beating yeah. Julio Cesar Chavez Jr. in what was an embarrassment from Chavez. Um, he's 2-1 and one as a pro because of that, uh, because of that win. <laughs> he steps in with boxing debutant and former UFC vet uh, Tito Ortiz. Um, that's over eight oh, wow. rounds there. And you've got one really good fight on the card between Andy Vences, 23-2 and two with a draw. He takes on Ireland's John O'Carroll, 19-2 and two with one draw. Former world title challenger, of course, pushed Tevin Farmer real close. And then lost to Maxi Hughes, who we spoke about a lot um, earlier on in part one with his great win against Strathon. And then he's been signed to Matchroom. We, we mentioned that in the news part. Um, since then, he hasn't done anything. It's not been too long, and it was it was kind of disputed. It was a close fight, but yeah, he's back against Andy Vences in America, so that that's going to be a good fight. I think you know John O'Carroll is is it's, it's a must win fight. I'm going to say that it's a must win fight for John O'Carroll. Hope he pulls through. He's a friend of the show, and um, another bizarre one: David Hay, twenty eight and four, returning to the ring after three years out. Uh, since his loss to Tony Bellew in the second of the of the two fights that they had, he steps in with one of his very best friends, Joe Fournier, who's nine and zero as a pro with nine KOs. Um, he, he boxed on a Triller undercard. I think it was a was it a Jake Paul undercard? I think uh, when he fought Ben Askren, he boxed on that undercard against some reggaeton singer. Um, but yeah, they are friends. Um, they were together on holiday at the time, on vacation at the time. I think in Joe Fournier's house in uh, in wherever it is. He's he's a multi millionaire, Joe Fournier, um, and you know they, they they're partying or whatever. And the story is that a girl said to you know she didn't know much about boxing, and she said to the two guys, "Who would win in a fight out of you two? And then that caused a discussion, and Joe Fournier said, at this point, I actually think I've got a good chance against David Hay. David Hay said, look, even if I had both my Achilles ruptured and my hands tied behind my back, I'd still beat you. I was a world-class fighter. And then Joe Fournier saying, hey, you know, we sparred sometimes in the ring, and I felt like I held my own, and now I think that I could, I could beat you. And then David Hay said, uh, you know, he said, I used to bring you in for the first couple of days of camp just because, you know, just to go easy. When I was really, really, really heating up for a fight, you weren't invited to those sparring sessions. So I don't know. I don't know. The <laughs> I've reached I've reached out to Joe Fournier. Eddie Hearn is saying that, you know, it's, it's just absolute masterful how they've managed to get people to pay for this because apparently the story is david hay is getting somewhere in excess of between five and seven million for this by the way that's what the story is uh, apparently he's getting paid more for this than he than he did in in either of the bellew fights uh, which is in, which is incredible. Um, he, he's looking good, but then again, David Hay literally looks good every single day of his life. Um, but you know, the little clips look good. But I just can't see how he's going to knock out his 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 friend. And I can't see. I I, I don't know. I, I'm just going to say this. I will be putting some money on that fight to go the distance. David Hay, who is a knockout yeah. merchant, I don't think he's going to be able to find the knockout. And Joe Fournier, who's nine and zero with nine KOs. I just can't see how these two really, really good friends, they've had businesses together, by the way. I cannot understand how they're going to, you know, I don't I, I don't know. I don't know. I wouldn't be surprised, Joe, if they're putting headgears on. It's no, just no, 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 they're not. No, 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 they're not. It's a proper that. fight. It's going down. It's going down. It's, it's going to count on their records as well, which is crazy because some people are saying, well, maybe it's going to end in a draw, but you can't really... 100% guarantee that the judges are going to see it like that, you know? Look, let me tell you something. If The only way that David Hay loses this fight is if he either truly is, is he, he's either truly not trying to hurt this guy and just going in there just to smack him around a little bit or if he's really just he couldn't have lost that much. I, I, there's no disrespect to this guy. I don't know who he is, but come on. It's David Hay. You know what I'm saying? And I'm not even the biggest David Hay supporter, but come on. He's a world-class fighter. You know what I mean? That's like thinking I'm going to go in there with LeBron James and just go ahead and beat him just because I play basketball a lot. It's not going to happen. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? I mean, no disrespect, but that's just the facts. Yeah, I mean, 
I don't know, I reached out to Joe Fournier and I said, listen, Joe, should I be putting my money on this fight to go to distance? And he said to me, no, 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 we're, we're going to go for it. We've put our, uh, our friendship aside. You know, we're going to be friends afterwards, but we've agreed it's an ego fight. We're going to just go for it. I really think I've got a chance. I, I don't know. I like Fournier. I, I really, I got a lot of time for Fournier. I've stuck up for Fournier before when people talk bad about the guy, but I don't, I, I don't, I just can't see how this can be serious, but you know what? I will be watching it. I won't be paying for it, mind you, but I will find a way to watch it. And, um, I like Fournier. He's a friend of the show. I, I was a massive fan of, of, of David Hay. But do you know what, Eddie? <laughs> I've got to say this now. I've spoken to a few people about this fight, and some people say, well, Joe Fournier is still trying to carve out a boxing career. He is fighting yeah. on a thriller undercard here again, and he's called out Jake Paul many times. He is He's offered Jake Paul money to fight him, like, I don't know, a couple million or whatever it was. Uh, he boxed on his undercard last time. Snoop Dogg actually said he wants to see Jake Paul fight um, Joe Fournier. Joe Fournier, I think last time as well, when he was on the undercard of Jake Paul, I believe he had Jake Paul's ex-girlfriend work in his corner. He's done everything he can to try and get under the skin of Jake Paul. If he were to beat David Hay here, it would go a long way for him looking good and everyone might want to see him fight uh, Jake Paul. However, if he gets knocked out like he should by David Hay in most people's eyes, yeah. that is the end of that. So it's like Joe Fournier, I think, has actually got more to lose because he's still undefeated. He's still won every fight by a knockout. David Hay is done. He's, you know, he's not trying to make a comeback and all that. We know that's not happening. So basically, it's a bad thing if Fournier loses. And yeah. David Hay's being paid a lot of money. And I've spoke to people and they're saying like, nah, but would David Hay really like throw himself on the floor for that much money? And I'm thinking to myself, I'm thinking to myself, if there's one guy that would do that, <laughs> it might be David Hay. I hate, I hate the fact I'm saying that I'm a massive Hay fan, but yeah, I don't know. He's like the guy that would, I think he, Hay would do anything for the right price. I think maybe, Hey, maybe sometimes you could be bought, you know? Yeah, that's just the way it goes. I mean, imagine if he, if he, if somehow jo Joe Fournier beats him, and I don't know, man. I mean, I won't force believe everyone. It. Yeah, it would force everyone to think that he must be legit and considered a, uh, you know, considered a genuine kind of contender or a genuine threat to anyone. Um, and that's something that I know means a great deal to to Joe Fournier. Joe Fournier has expressed many times to me that. You know, he doesn't feel like he's loved, you know, by the fans. They think he's just here for a, for a laugh and a joke. But, he, you know, he's took it serious. He's, he's, you know, from entrepreneur to boxer, he's got enough money to not ever need to box. You know, he made his, he doesn't make money from boxing, to be quite frank. Only, only since his Triller link up has come around. But, yeah, we shall see. It's going to be weird seeing Hay walk out again, you know, but I will be watching it and, um, yeah, Hay, you know, the excitement I used to have watching Hay fight. And I know I don't like to bang on about it too much in front of you, Eddie, because he did call you fast food, Eddie Chambers, that time. I love but, that. Um... That's one of my favorite names of all time. <laughs> I swear to God, I wish I could fight again just so I can use that name. <laughs> I swear to God, I love that name. I, I call myself that name. I wish I was as creative. I wish I was that creative to actually use that. <laughs> I would have fucking put that on my trunks and everything. I'm so scary. Okay, well, there we go. We've gone through the review part. We had our sole guest, the fabulous Chantel Cameron. In part two, we did the news. We've just wrapped up the preview part of the show. The final thing for me to do is to come in with the outro, which I'll do in just a few seconds. Okay, and this wraps up episode 308 of the Box Hard Podcast. I've been your host, Joey Coastman. Eddie Chambers has been with me for the duration of the show. A huge thank you to our special guest, Chantel Cameron. The biggest thanks of all, though, goes out to you, the listeners. I have, since finishing recording most of this podcast, seen Evander Holyfield on the pads, and I've got to say, it doesn't look good. Forgive me also for not having any idea about uh, Vita Belfort. Some of you uh, informed me on Twitter of what he's about, and uh, I think... You know, he's the favorite in this fight. It seems like there's a reason behind that now after some of you making it clear to me. So I appreciate that. But that's about everything from myself. Enjoy your weekends, people. Stay safe and we shall see you all again next week.